Have you ever met people in your life where they were just marked by a certain characteristic that every time that you thought about them, every time that you had an experience with them, you immediately went to some character trait that just encapsulates who they are, how they respond, how they act. And based on how they act and how they respond and what they're known for, it kind of determines how much time you want to spend with that person. There was a young man that I went to school with, and he was absolutely infatuated with history and war in particular. Uh, he loved studying war, studying history, studying the patterns of war and uh, all kinds of different battle plans. He was just an aficionado when it came to uh, the great wars of our country. From the Revolutionary War to World War II, he knew anything and everything that you really wanted to know about it. He could answer the question and he could tell you about it. He was infatuated with guns and knives and ammunition and military strategy. And the older he got and the more infatuated he became, he just became angry. And every time that you talked about it, he would just spew anger. And quite honestly, uh, the more he got spun up about it, the less interested I became and the more I wanted to kind of get away from the situation. He just kind of became marked by anger. And then we all know those people that when they walk in the room, you could have a pleasantly normal conversation, a completely normal uh, lunch or family get together, but a certain person shows up and all of a sudden, what was normal all of a sudden just becomes chaotic. And there is uh, words that are shared and um, people get their feelings hurt, tension rises. And that person's just marked by drama. Wherever they come, drama follows. Drama queens, drama kings, drama, drama, drama. It just kind of uh, is who they are. They are marked by drama. And then I love people that are marked by fun. You just know if you're going to be around them, you're going to laugh. You're going to have a good time. Whether it's over a meal or a ball game or a movie or just hanging out, having a cup of coffee, sharing a conversation. When you're around them, you're, you are assured you are going to have a great time. You're going to have fun. People are marked by characteristics that they have, and, and they, it just becomes a part of who they are, their DNA, if you will. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, that as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, we should be marked by grace. And there are some characteristics that follow that. And that's what I want to talk to you tonight about from God's Word, marked by grace. And we're going to pick up our text in the book of Titus, chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 11 through 15. Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Here's what Paul writes to Titus. He says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Paul here is writing this letter to Titus, one of his ministry helpers. And the book of Titus is found in a collection of scripture that we call the pastoral epistles that Paul wrote. And this letter is characterized by being very personal to Titus. Uh, most likely Titus, a convert, a, a man that, that Paul led to faith in Christ. It's personal in nature, yet the way Paul writes it, it's designed almost to be overheard by the churches. You've ever been in those situations where someone's talking to you, but they kind of want the people around you to hear the conversation as well. And that's kind of the, the tone we get of the book or the letter of Titus, where Paul is writing to Titus, but he wants the churches to kind of overhear what he is saying. 
Titus is in great similarity to Timothy, considered to be a son in the ministry to the Apostle Paul. We know that Titus was a faithful and special assistant to the Apostle Paul, a trusted leader and troubleshooter. In fact, Paul leaves him behind in Crete to continue ministering and teaching the churches. And as we come to the end of chapter 2 that we've read this evening, Paul gives some very practical and timely advice to the to Titus and to the Christian believers as well. And he gives us some characteristics that I believe if our lives are to be marked by grace, characterized by the grace of God, there's some characteristics that we need to see in the lives of believers and in our lives as believers. And and first tonight, I want to talk about this. We need to live holy lives. If our lives are to be marked by grace, we need to live holy lives. In verse 11 and 12, we read, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So Paul starts in verse 11 by reminding us that we are saved by the grace of God. That it is the grace of God that brings about salvation. And it is a practical reminder we did not save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. We have no ability to save ourselves. It is the work of God's grace in our lives to bring salvation to lost mankind. But Paul continues that this salvation has appeared to all men, which indicates to us that sinners didn't find salvation or find the grace of God on their own. No, we have experienced it, uh, as Paul wrote, it, because it is, it is through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, the Son of God, that God the Father sent to us, we have experienced grace because Jesus came looking for us. We did not find it on our own. And so he has sent salvation for all men who will receive it. And then he moves into verse number 12 on living a holy life. You see, Paul is really reminding us that salvation doesn't just change our position from lost to found. From death to life. From lost to saved. It just doesn't change our position, but... When we are saved, when we begin walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, when our lives are marked by grace, it changes everything. Our attitudes, our appetites, our ambition, our actions, it changes everything. See, because we've been marked by grace, we should live a holy life. The same grace that changed us and cleansed us from our sins is the same grace that empowers us to live a godly and holy life. That is the Christ life. That is to be Christ-like. Our goal each and every day as believers, as someone whose lives are marked by the grace of God, is to be more like Jesus. Christ-like. So every day when we get up, while we are still adorned with this flesh, this sinful flesh, the Spirit of God in us, uh, manifesting in us, we we should be living and, and by the grace of God living our lives to please the Lord and to be more like Him and less like Uh, The old life. We have to crucify the flesh, Paul reminds us, to crucify the flesh and become more like Jesus. And you know, this is a difficult challenge, isn't it? Every day, when you, it seems like when you purpose to live a godly life, you purpose to make good decisions, Christ-honoring decisions, when you do your very, very best to live like Jesus, to talk like Jesus, to act like Jesus, it's like the enemy knows that we have purposed to do better and he throws every obstacle at us to try and create stumbling blocks for us. Sometimes the good things of life become a stumbling block for us. I don't know about you, but it is easy to fall into the trap of the old life. It is a difficult challenge to crucify the flesh. In a moment of unexpected uh, um, conflict or unexpected aggravation, it is 
so easy for the flesh to rise up and before you know it, you've blown it. Before you've known it, the Christ life, living a holy life, has been thrown out of the window and you are wallowing around in sin. Thank God for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankful for repentance and forgiveness. This Christ life is very hard to live. It's not always easy. But I want to encourage you tonight that it's, it, we can break it down by taking some practical steps. Every decision that you face, every encounter that you face, is an opportunity that the Lord gives us to make great decisions and Christ-honoring decisions and be more like Jesus. How did you treat the cashier in the checkout line? It was an opportunity to be like Jesus. Did you love like Jesus? Did you talk like Jesus? Did you share good things? Did you participate in building someone up or tearing someone down? It's the practical little steps. It can be overwhelming to think, oh, I've got to be like Jesus all the time. And yes, that is the goal. But when you think about it, just break it down into tiny bite-sized sections of your life one conversation at a time, one decision at a time, one opportunity at a time. Lord, I want to be controlled by your Holy Spirit. I want to be like Jesus. I want to put away the things of the flesh, and I want to live holy, a holy life. I want to make a Christ-honoring decision. I'm telling you, it's so easy to lose your, Christ, <clears throat> your, your Christ-likeness on the highways here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm telling you, it's hard to... It's hard to to keep your Christ likeness on the exits of the highways of Atlanta, Georgia. And just a personal testimony, you're not in the room tonight to, uh, for, for me to, to gauge whether you're going to be more spiritual than I am, but I'll just put it, put it all out there. I will tell you, um, <clears throat> it, it can be very frustrating driving in Atlanta. And uh, just, a, just a couple of weeks ago, I was stopped on exit 30 right here off of 285 trying to get to the church. And to be honest, I was running a little behind for a meeting. And the traffic was piled up on the exit waiting at the, uh, waiting at the stoplight to go on to Cotillion or turn right on to North Peachtree. And finally the light turned green. And um, the cars in front of me went on except the car right in front of me. And they were dead stopped. And there was a long uh, path from that car to the stoplight. And people behind me were starting to get frustrated and blow the horn. And, and I, I, I'm going to tell you, my flesh started rising up in me. I, I don't know if they were texting or they were on social media or checking an email. I, I don't know what had distracted them. But obviously the light was green and they weren't going. And I'm telling you, my flesh was rising up to, to blow my horn just so that I could communicate to them kindly and loudly that it was time for them to move through the intersection. But the spirit in me said, oh, you probably shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that that close to the church. Oh, but I want to, blo I want to do it. And I had this internal battle between the flesh and the spirit. And thank the Lord that one time God gave me grace to overcome my need to blow the horn and indicate they need to move on. And I didn't blow the horn. They finally got the point and they moved through the intersection only to turn into First Baptist Church of Atlanta. And hallelujah, praise the Lord. I didn't blow the horn and lose my testimony before getting out and walking into the same building at the same time. You see, being Christ-like is just those moments in time. Lord, give me help to make the right decisions. I want to be like you. I want to respond like you. I want to live a way that glorifies God. And Paul highlights in verse 12, there's like this, this, when we're talking about living a holy life, there's like there's this negative of denying ourselves and then the positive of putting on some things. And so when we think about the negative or, or this denial of ungodliness, that is anything, any action, any thought, any deed that's unlike God, against the Lord, not like Jesus, all the worldly lust. We need to uh, put those things aside. We need to deny those things. John writes in 1 John chapter 2, in verses 15 through 17, Do not love the world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. 
These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. John practically writes that we are, the world offers everything. And what the world offers usually is fulfilling. It is satisfying. And that's the reason I say this is the, this is the negative of denying uh, flesh or living a holy life. It's negative because we need to do it. We need to deny these things. But it is so easy to fall into the trap of sin. I, I don't know about you, but most sin is fun. We know it's fun for a season. But it is easy to follow the broad way. It is easy to get pulled into uh, the pleasures of life, to the pleasures of the eyes, to the lust of the flesh. It is usually satisfying, gratifying, and we are drawn to it. And that's the reason there's that negative side of we've got to crucify that flesh. We've got to deny ourselves and pursue the holy life. And then Paul continues to write that we must work on the positive side of the holy life. There's the denying of uh, worldly pleasure. There's the denying of self. There's the denying of sin. And then as we live a holy life, we need to pursue sober-mindedness. That is, that we want to build in our life self-control. We want to build into ourselves restraint. And, and we want to deal properly with ourselves. This is all, of course, a mark of God's grace, a ministry of God's grace. We can't do any of this apart from Him and apart from the leadership of the Holy Spirit in us and His control over our lives and our surrender is Lordship. This isn't something we can just do or work on. It is all with the Spirit's help. But we're also to live righteously. And that is with our relationships with other people, how we treat others, how we live our lives righteously and holy with others and then, uh, and then we must live godly. And that is our relationship with the Lord. We must please Him and honor Him. So Paul is setting up that holiness is a decision of the whole person. Dr. Warren Risby kind of presented that. He says it, 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 is, it is a decision of the whole person. God, self, and others. Holiness has impact. And in this present age that we live in and the culture that we are a part of, it is so easy to resemble it, to live like it, to be drawn into it. But living the holy life, a life marked by God's grace, is a life of separation. That while we live in this world, we're not to be of this world. We should not be conformed to it. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, a very familiar passage of Scripture. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God. All of this to say we cannot walk according to the world's standards. We cannot walk according to the lust of our eyes, the pride of life. We cannot, uh, the successful life in the world is not the same life of success written in God's word. It is different. We are separate. We are called out. We are a different people because we are marked by God's grace. Paul writes, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. And I love how the New Living Translation puts it. He says, you used to live in sin. Just like the rest of the world obeying the devil. The commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So you see, if our lives are to be marked by the grace of God, if our lives are to be marked by those who are His, who belong to Jesus, saved, walking with the Lord, a personal relationship with Him, we must live a holy life. But second tonight, not only must we live a holy life, we need to look for Christ's return. Look for Christ's return. Paul continues writing in Titus chapter 2. We look in verses 13 and 14. He says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We as believers should be looking for Jesus Christ to return. Our eyes should be 
on the return of Jesus. Our heart should be focused on heaven, on eternity, on that which waits in front of us. And if you aren't, you should be. Paul encourages Titus, not only should we be looking for his return, but we are doing so, doing so because that is our hope and glory. You know, there are far more elaborate passages in the Bible about heaven uh, where we have descriptions of what heaven's going to be like, the activity of heaven, the beauty of the place, the streets of gold, the gates of pearl, the walls of jasper. We read about the people of heaven. We think about all those who have gone before us. We think about the angels and the, 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 the patriarchs who have gone on before. We think of seeing Jesus and laying our eyes on that beautiful city of heaven. But I love the simplicity of this passage here in Titus chapter 2. The simplicity of the verse. We, we don't get caught away in the dramatics and the majesty and the details and the mystery that surrounds the place of heaven. We are simply confronted with the truth that Jesus is coming and the imperative that we should be looking for it. Do you know that, the, that believers have been expecting the return of Jesus since he resurrected from the dead and ascended back to heaven. The day that Jesus ascended back into heaven to be with his Father, people began looking for the return of Christ. In fact, they lived with an ever-present reminder that it could be today. They lived lives of obedience. They went out and shared the gospel and the passion of their preaching and the passion of their evangelism and the passion of their missionary journeys of Paul and others were because Jesus was coming. That was the message of the day. Jesus is coming. And not only was it a message that Jesus was coming for expectancy, the Christian church was under attack and under assault. Whether it was Rome or others that were seeking to silence the voice of the Christians, to silence the move of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was, a, there was hardship. There was, uh, there, was, uh, there was great hostility in many places towards the gospel. Of course, when we read the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, how many times did we find him stoned or imprisoned or beaten or run out of town? There was a hostility towards the message of the gospel. And so it was this preaching and this reminder that Jesus is coming. This expectation that their hope was going to be found in looking for the Lord Jesus to return. It was the fuel in their tank to help them face the hardship of the day. To face the culture of the day. To face the hostility that came their way. It was the return of Jesus Christ. And yet as our world gets darker and darker, we continue to look for hope and satisfaction in other things. If we can get more money, if we can drive the right car, if we can have the right job, if we can marry the right spouse, if we can have the perfect kids, if we can have the perfect home, if we could wear the right clothes, if we had this talent or that talent or this ability or that ability... We look for signs and wonders and all of these different things. And the point is, Jesus is coming back. That is our hope. That is our endurance. Jesus Christ is coming back. And are you ready? The greatest preparation you can make is personally that you have settled all things with the Lord Jesus Christ. That you've given your life to Him. That He is the Savior of your sin and Lord of your life. And you are ready for Him to return any day. And when obstacles and hardship and trials come your way, you need to take hope in the anchored truth of Scripture that Jesus is coming back. If our lives are to be marked by the grace of God, we need to be looking for the return of Jesus. What gets us through divisive times such as these... Jesus is coming. What encourages our broken hearts? Jesus is coming. What softens the wounds of loss and tragedy? Jesus is coming. And the truth is, as believers, we should always be expecting His return and live ready to see Him face to face. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. The goal is not of 
the best life possible. The goal is heaven. The goal is not a problem-free life. The goal is heaven. The goal is not uh, success in the world's eyes. The goal is heaven. Tonight, if you find yourself discouraged, if you find yourself distracted by the cares of life, if you find yourself depressed by life circumstances, if you find yourselves defeated, look to the promised return of Jesus. There is a better life. There is a mansion prepared just for you. There is going to be an eternal worship service in the sky, and Jesus is coming back. This world while it may seem out of control, God is sovereign. Dr. George reminded us Sunday as he preached that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of our world and our life. My question to you tonight is are you ready for Christ to come? And if you can say yes and your life has been marked by the grace of Jesus Christ, look for the return of Jesus. He's coming back. So not only should we live holy lives and be looking for Christ's return, but finally tonight we need to love others with the gospel. We need to love others with the gospel. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul says, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. He says, speak these things, proclaim, proclaim, speak them, talk about them. Share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Share about Jesus. Share your personal story. Share your testimony. Let others know what he has done in your life and for you. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 55 verse 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And I hope you're encouraged by that verse tonight because it simply means we are not responsible for the results. We just are called to speak and speak the truth and share the gospel in love. We need to love others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the results of the gospel are up to the Lord up to the work of the Holy Spirit in that person's life. I can't save you. I can't persuade you. I can't make you do anything. I am simply called by God to share the truth, to share the story of how Jesus has changed my life, to give you the opportunity to trust Him as Savior, and for you to make your own decision uh, of, of, of responding in faith to the work of Jesus and, and His grace. But if you're focused on the results being up to you, you will always be discouraged. You will always feel like uh, less than. But a freeing truth is that while we are called to speak and to love others with the gospel and share the truth of what God has done and what he can do in anybody's life, we aren't responsible for the results. You know, there's a lot of great formulas. There's a lot of great ways to share your faith. But you know, some of the most practical ways that I've seen to be effective, not only in personal evangelism and witnessing of folks that I've been able to share with, but seen others do, is simply sharing your story. No one can argue with your story. No one can take away from what God has done in your life. And you may be intimidated by going through the Romans road or various other uh, uh, tools that 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 people have given us that are effective and successful. But sometimes the most successful uh, way to love others with the gospel is simply to share your personal story. Speak of the good things of the Lord. Be a witness for Christ. I will tell you another very underestimated a way to love others with the gospel is really what we were talking about in the first point tonight, and that's living a Christ-like life. When you respond to people with kindness, where they're used to being cursed at and fussed at and yelled at and mistreated, and they see somebody responding with kindness, when someone's under adversity and they're still operating in the joy of the Holy Spirit and the joy of their salvation, when people see us respond to tragedy, to grief, to unexpected loss, to surprise, to challenge, to chaos, and we respond to it with the, 
the light of the gospel, with the joy of the Lord, with kindness, with peace. They see us anchored in our faith, not wavering when the storms of life come our way. It's a greater witnessing tool than you will ever imagine. Because all of a sudden, people witness us living the life Christ is designed for us to live. Trusting in Him, trusting in His grace, marked by His grace. And all of a sudden, they take notice and say, Hey, what do they have that I don't have? I, whatever they have, I want that. I want to get in on what they've got. We need to be a witness for Christ. We need to speak. Paul said, speak. But then... We have some other words that he used, and that's to exhort. To strongly encourage or urge someone to do something. That's what the word exhort means. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 reads, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The New Living Translation puts that verse like this. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and harden against God. We must strongly encourage and urge others to not only respond to the gospel but live marked by grace. We must encourage one another. You know, I am grateful for the encouragers in my life. I'm grateful for those people that speak encouraging words to me, whether it's through an email or a text or a phone call or a card in the mail. Those that are just sharing words of exhortation, words urging to continue on, continue speaking, continue serving, continue living for the Lord, because I'm telling you, if we're honest with one another, it gets weary sometimes serving the Lord. It gets weary living this life for Jesus, especially those that um, are, are around uh, work in secular work environments or are in hostile family situations where maybe there's unsaved relatives or loved ones. There is a, there's a world that is against us. There is a foe, the enemy, who is against us. By, the Bible calls him a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so there's this there is this constant onslaught of attack that the enemy is bringing at us. Never underestimate the power of an encouraging word for someone to continue walking and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Living marked by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes the greatest things that can be said, I'm praying for you, you're going to make it. I'm praying for you. Keep sharing the faith with your husband. Keep sharing the gospel with your wife. Keep praying for your kids. Keep, uh, keep walking in faith. God's going to move. Exhort. But then Paul says, he uses this word rebuke. This strong expression of disreproof, uh, dis di disapproval, reproof or correction. And, and we don't like that. Our culture doesn't like that. Now, Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, John writes, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Who he loves, he rebukes. We are commanded here that we're to love others with the gospel, and love takes on various forms. We speak and we share the truth. We encourage and challenge. But we must lovingly call out and confront. You see, you, you can't find an answer or a solution or help until you recognize there's a problem. And while we need to be loving and never hateful or unkind, as we see everything unfolding in our culture, in our society, in our families, we must lovingly call out the false, to call out the darkness, to call out the onslaught of the enemy for what it is and speak truth, yes in love, but we must confront with truth. If we're going to be marked by the gospel, we can't just willingly love everybody while not speaking the truth because if we can't tell the truth, it's not real love. Paul ends this by encouraging Timothy, let no one despise you and don't let anyone think less of you. 
Maybe we should say this, don't let what others think of you affect you and keep you from living a life marked by grace. You know, the power of what other people think, it's significant, isn't it? I don't know about you, but most of us like to be liked. I don't know too many people who say, hey, you know what, I want people to dislike me. I I, I want people to, to be mean to me and not like me. Most of us want to be liked. Most of us want to get along. I certainly do. It, it causes me great anxiety when I feel that somebody is against me or if I've offended somebody or somebody doesn't like me. I want to fix it. I want, to, I, want to, I want everybody to be peaceful and harmonious and together. How many times are we held back from being who God's called us to be, loving others with the gospel because we're afraid of them thinking less of us or just thinking anything bad about us at all. Don't let that affect you. You see, the grace of God is powerful. It has changed us. It has saved us. It has, uh, it, it has changed our entire lives. Without it, we can do nothing. It is the grace of God that saved us and it keeps us. It is the grace of God that will lead us home and we will see Jesus face to face. And in the meantime, we need to live lives marked by it. We must live holy lives. We need to look for the return of Jesus. Be ready and waiting And we need to love others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The day is getting late. It is getting darker. And we need to love others with the gospel like never before. You know, growing up, I I had a there was there was a young man in our in our school, and he was just he was just an odd guy. He was just quirky. Uh, He didn't really fit in. Um, some of the upperclassmen bullied him a little bit, made fun of him, laughed about him, laughed about some things he would say, his mannerisms. But Logan was a guy who just loved everybody. People could have been making fun of him, and he didn't care. He may not even known it. He would have sat right down, do you need anything? Can I get you a Pepsi? Can I get you a Gatorade or a bottle of water? How are you, how's your day? He would talk to anybody. He would talk to anybody. I never will forget, we would leave um, one of our pastimes. We would go to a little Mexican restaurant right by our school and eat chips and salsa and have a good time after basketball games. And I never will forget so many times walking to my car and seeing Logan in the bleachers cleaning up the stands. He wasn't paid to do that. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't on the team that cleaned up the gym. He just did it. He helped wherever there was a need. He served where there was an opportunity. Our, um, there were committees in our school that they helped with the landscaping. He wasn't on any of them. He would go out and help pull weeds and plant flowers, spread mulch. He was always involved in trying to make people better, the school better, situations better. He was just a great guy. Didn't have a lot in common with him. Kind of walked to the beat of his own drum. But his life was marked by the grace of God. Every time I think about him, I think about he just served so faithfully. He was always so kind. He was also always so nice. He never got any recognition for it. He wasn't a straight-A student. He wasn't the president of the student body. He was just a faithful and good guy. I never will forget in our senior year, he was awarded a special student leadership award and he was as surprised as anybody but I watched as so many people stood and rallied and applauded and all of the all of the jokes and all of the people had made fun of him they all kind of realized he had made an impact and the impact he had made he was a Christ honoring godly encouraging young man And he made a difference on all of us by just watching him be like Jesus. That his life was marked by the grace of God. He lived for the Lord. He lived lived like Jesus. He made a great difference. And here's the, as I close tonight, here's here's the opportunity we all have. If we walk with the Lord and we profess Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, we're Christians, we claim to walk with the Lord. I challenge you tonight, may our lives be found in keeping with what we say about Jesus, 
with what we preach about Jesus, with what we know to be true about Jesus and His grace. May our lives be found living in such a way that the reports line up. That our lives with who we say, what we say about Him and how we live, that that report would line up. May our lives be marked by His grace. And wherever you are tonight, and whatever you're doing, whatever life circumstances you're in, whatever challenges you may be facing, you can make the decision right now with God's grace, Lord, I want to live a holy life. If you are wound up by all of the stuff going on in our world, and the crises and elections and politics and division and personal strife, get your eyes on Jesus is coming back. He's in control. And God the Father knows the exact moment he's going to say, Son, go get my children and we're going to be with him. Look for Christ's return. And while we have time, let's be found faithful, loving others with the gospel of Jesus Christ because the truth of the gospel is this. The same grace and the same Jesus who's changed our life is still active and changing the lives of others. Let's be faithful to share the message. Let's our lives be marked by God's grace. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these truths. And Lord, help us to live for you, to live like you, and to make a difference for you in our city, in our nation, and world. Oh God, we give you praise for who you are. And we look for that glorious appearing, the blessed hope that you are coming back. Until then, find us faithful and give us strength to face challenging and ever-changing days with the changeless, timeless truth of your holy word. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.